Well, here we are live. The first yeah. tuba chat uh, delayed from a week ago, thanks to uh, Facebook improving their uh, process right while we were using it. Yeah, so we're very happy to be here. I'm Chuck uh, Dellenbach, Canadian Brass for, uh, well, we're in our 50th season. And I've invited a very uh, illustrious young tuba player, which I thought would counterbalance uh, between us, I think the average age is about the same as the uh, as my other colleagues in the Canadian Brass, so that <laughs> it'll, it'll work out. So please meet uh, Jarrett McCourt. Hello. I can't it's really see. nice to be here, Chuck. There you are. There we go. So Jarrett is a uh, a Canadian, first of all. Uh, I think you see on his shirt says Canadian. Does your shirt say Canadian? Yeah, good. Right there, Jared. yeah. Jared is Canadian, uh, went to the uh, university in uh, London, Ontario, and yeah. then uh, completed uh, your studies at the uh, University of Michigan, which um, I think this uh, University of Michigan will come up uh, many times today, so we won't labor it right now because it yeah. needs to be a center point of the, uh, the conversation as we go along here. Um, so Canadian Brass, we've instituted in this time of um, house arrest or staying home or staying uh, uh, away from other people, we've instituted a set of uh, these webcasts, each dealing with well, one of the instruments, trumpets, trombone, what's the other one? Circular, circular, horn, horn, and the tuba. And uh, then we have the uh, Canadian Brass, the general Canadian Brass, where we invite uh, former members and illustrious uh, other people that uh, we think that people we know would like to meet or to hear from as well. So this is uh, uh, quite a new venture for us, maybe something we should have started with um, eight millimeter films in the 70s and then moved to uh, uh, others. But here we are, finally doing this. And um, it seemed to me that uh, what people like to know about the tuba is just about everything. It's <laughs> Because it's so big, audiences can't help, but I, I've seen this every time we perform, uh, the eyes just go to the tuba, this focuses on the tuba, it's, it's, it's constant. So, so do you find that, Jared? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really funny when you do like an education show or something, like the little kids are always fixated on like the largest instrument, which is always kind of strange because we often have so little of like the interesting melodic material <laughs> you, oh, you weren't supposed in, to say that. Wasn't that on the thing not to say? The two oh, oops, yeah, sorry. No, it's all about the bass. We know the song. I mean, it's, it's all it's, about the bass, yeah. The tuba, the tuba player is very fortunate because, uh, well, you can take it from other styles of music. If you have a, a roll on a piano, it never starts from the top down. It's always the bottom that begins that. The bottom is very important. It can, it can uh, set the pitch control rhythm it can be very, very forceful, which um, creates a lot of interesting conversations in uh, group rehearsals because it also means that responsibility, you are held to a, uh, a level of performance that's, that's sometimes difficult to meet for pitch and yeah. rhythm and so forth. And the uh, trumpet players uh, are very, very picky about the bass player they work with. And, uh, Definitely. Now, no, your experience, Jared, you've you trained in the normal way. You went to conservatories and uh, you learned everything you needed to learn to play auditions. But you've done a, a lot of solo work. How, how did those two to come together? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it sort of stems from being a little bored with what we often get to play in band and orchestra <laughs> and i'm sorry i just like can't not bring this up because it's the reality and i'm a realist um but there it just reached a certain point where i was just so much more interested firstly by you know observing other instrumentalists like violinists and violists and um well, maybe not violists but violinists and cellists have all this great solo material and then us just sort of be relegated to the to the back of the orchestra. And it started out by me listening to soloists like Oystein Bodzevic and sort of realizing that he is, uh, re he was really like pushing and, and trailblazing a path forward for, for tuba as a solo instrument. 
By the way, did you know you mentioned Oystein? Uh, he's Norwegian. Yeah. But you didn't uh, draw the parallel that um, my mother's Norwegian. Oh, well, now I know name. that. It's not in my name because uh, you always take your father's name, which is Swiss. I know you wanted to know that, but by yeah. the way, uh, my longtime colleague in the Canadian Brass, Gene Watts, trombonist, had played in many orchestras, San Antonio, North Carolina, and Toronto Symphony, principal trombone in Toronto Symphony for many years. And I asked him the question, how do you deal with, say, Beethoven Fifth Symphony, three movements, you're just resting, and suddenly you have to come in in a high C. And he said, well, I've always felt my role in the orchestra I get to play these wonderful parts, but I also have the best seat in the house to listen to that orchestra. Yeah, totally. So he took it as an opportunity really to hear music and listen to music. Well, that's, I mean, that's like, like just for us, right? Like for example, in Symphony Fantastique, like that's such a big part for us by Berlioz. But what, you know, when you're working on the excerpt, what you often don't realize is that you sit in the orchestra for about 32 minutes before you even start to think about playing a note, which is at the end of the fourth movement. Um, I always thought that was really interesting. I mean, you probably have the same, like, so when you were playing all this, you know, stuff in the orchestra and, and stuff in the band, like what got you interested in playing in the quintet? Was it sort of the same thing or? Opportunity to perform. Yeah. In the quintet, you have complete, uh, you know, every school now has an entrepreneurial course of some nature to suggest to students that they need to make their own way in music. I think I just came to that naturally that uh, I enjoyed playing these other kinds of music and actually more of the social event of working with other players. Uh, I've been very fortunate in my lifetime to have, I would say that every player I've worked with is a, is a, uh, a better player than I am. So I'm, I'm I seen it talk about the best seat in the house again, to be yeah. able to participate at that level and to have people that you can really admire and, um, and copy. I mean, it just, it would be, it, it would be an endless group of names to start with Ronnie Rahm. I, I think I mentioned this on an earlier podcast, but there's no, there's no, there's, we know about perfect pitch, but there's no word for perfect rhythm. There's not yeah. quite a, it's a little bit undefinable, but if there was, Ronnie Rahm would have that title. And it was really uh, amazing to work with him all those years and just, uh, just be really conscious of, of following that really extremely high example of, of art and then to to and each person brought their own personality a recent horn podcast we talked with david ohanian about his memory unfortunately for people like me to have to work with somebody like david ohanian you know i was jealous of this ability he'd play a piece of music once maybe twice memorized and then he would continue to hear the entire he could fill in if somebody dropped out and didn't play their part he could just fill it in he just has that musical memory. It's not like uh, um, photographic memory where somebody remembers everything they read or they can see it again or something. It was a tonal memory which was really amazing. So each person brings that different personality but I think the reason people are attracted to playing brass quintet or chamber ensembles in general is that you have more responsibility. You, you are more, more in charge of your own destiny, musical destiny in an ensemble and uh, it's, it's a different experience. I mean, there's a thrill of sitting in the back of an orchestra and playing this giant chord in a Prokofiev piece or something where Tuba gets a lot to play or Wagner, but actually participating and being part of the, uh, the process in a, in a chamber ensemble, you get, to, you get to dig in anything that interests you, there's something in it for you. It can be everything from music to scholarship, history, to instrument design, to uh, business, finance, uh, booking, management, recording, every aspect is open. So you, you realize very quickly in that kind of uh, milieu that you can make the decisions that propel, in this case, uh, a musical group. Non-musicians would consider it a business enterprise. You, you propel that enterprise and having that uh, opportunity uh, and you think people in the back row of an orchestra or the opportunity to create your own destiny and be standing I think to me a, a major moment was playing in the uh, Concerthaus in, in Vienna 
like if you think where did brass start if you want to reach back centuries it would be right there and we were standing on the 2000 seat hall filled to the brim with standing people are standing around in the back and we're playing a brass quintet and i, I remember distinctly uh, eugene and i were bowing and gene looked over as we're bowing he says pinch me is this real <laughs> we're brass players how did this happen <laughs> But, but it is fantastic that you you set out and and the, the key is to set out with achievable objectives don't 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 go to college and say if i don't become the tuba player of the chicago symphony i quit <laughs> there's so many things that can be done in music so many things that can be done that anybody yeah can. i mean I, there's i mean there's just so much that you said that from the past like five minutes that's so important and I, I'd been listening to a lot of these talks that the Canadian brass has been putting on and one that I think was really really great was the one with Ryan Anthony um, last week and you know on top of being just such an inspirational person he gave some really tangible advice for young musicians who during this time just you know have a lot of extra time on their hands and one of the things he said, and basically just the same thing that you said, was that instead of just every day going to practice for a couple hours and, you know, working on your fundamentals with no end goal in sight, I mean, just really feels like you're sort of a hamster in a, you know, in a wheel, you know, you're just sort of running after this thing and maybe there's a stick on a carrot in front of you and you're trying to chase it and you're just never going to get it. But having these goals, you know, like, for example, like performing an etude for a couple of friends on Zoom at the end of a week, or you know, uh, playing for your teacher over Zoom or FaceTime, I think it's just, I mean, it's so important during this time, you know, just at a time when a lot of people have, you know, a little bit of extra time to work on, on things. And sometimes that can be sort of detrimental to your, uh, your growth if you're not doing anything, you know, uh, or having any, any goals. It was but, a, uh, yeah. our, our mentor in, in Chicago, we've mentioned many, many, many times, said that practice sessions, you should look at those as performance. And once that, that turned my head around, because I'm not a fan of rehearsing. I don't love rehearsing or practicing just on your own. You got 10 days straight and play for four hours a day. Okay, you do it, but it's not that attractive. But when you think of it as a performance and you're really trying to play your very best, and this is another thing that we developed in our group, the idea of someone would say, well, I could have played that better. I just didn't. No, you couldn't because you didn't. You can't go back and say, I could have. Well, then do so, you know, like really dig in and always be present. I think that's the, the, the kind of the key. Uh, Jared, just so, so people, and I think people can look my name up and they'll find all kinds of, you know, all the things I've done. It's, it's, well, I did one thing. I can't, I can't remember quite well. But, <laughs> But it is possible to find, my background is easy to find. And uh, uh, when you when you do Dellenbach search on uh, anything? I think so, yeah. A lot of scientists come up. I wonder if I could have been a scientist if I just, you know, well, nevertheless. You're sort anyway. of a tuba scientist. Well, back to you, Jared. So, <laughs> so you started, uh, uh, your first teacher was Ron Parker. We know Ron. Yeah. That was a yeah, good yeah, experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was it was sort sort of a short time, and I I studied with Brent Adams, who uh, okay. plays in in Niagara, and in London, and a couple of their different places. Um, and I studied with him for my whole undergrad. And he has a real sort of pragmatic approach to the tuba. And I was you know I sort of went into my undergrad being this super idealistic person, wanting to play every solo, wanting to do everything. And he sort of reined me in a little bit, which I think was really important. And it's uh, I don't know. I, I think it's really important to have different teachers at different points in your development as a musician. And at, at that time, Brent, I mean, showed me everything. He, he showed me how to basically the how to fix like all the problems in my playing. And then when I went to Michigan and studied with Fritz Kenzig, um, that's sort of when the uh, nose sort of met the grindstone. And I, I sort of, um, you know, started to take auditions and started to get more serious about um, things like that. And I actually have a picture of the first time that we met in person, which was when I was at Michigan. Um, and I don't know, I'm sure maybe you remember this. 
<laughs> this competition. Do you see that? I'll be back. Yeah. That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that well, was, uh, at, that was my hair. Oh, no, look at your hair. Yeah, it's pretty tall. <laughs> That's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, um, nice. But that, that was sort of a lot of what I did at Michigan, just sort of like mm -hmm. competitions. And um, I remember that competition was one of the first times, I mean, that I was able to play and um, get feedback. And I think it's just really in, important to, you know, after you've amassed all the skills in your undergrad, it's like when you get to your graduate degree, that's the time mm -hmm. to go do stuff, like take auditions, take competitions, you know, do things like that. Um, so yeah. You, you know what they say though, the higher your degree, the less, the, it just took you longer to find a job. Absolutely. Our horn <laughs> player, Jeff, Jeff Nelson has, uh, uh, I don't know if people know this publicly. Well, they will now. He was uh, only two years into his degree at uh, McGill in Quebec when he won a mm -hmm. he won an orchestra engagement. And yeah, it was Winnipeg, wasn't it? It was Winnipeg. Yeah, I believe yeah. that's right. And then uh, later he played Montreal Symphony, and then uh, and then the career went from there. But uh, the degree is not necessarily there was a. a uh, Sumner Erickson was a tuba player in the Pittsburgh Symphony. He had just started the uh, Curtis School, so he must have been 17, 18. He just started and they came through to audition and he won the job and uh, actually never, I don't think he got past a couple months at the Curtis School and went right into the profession. Yeah. So playing, performing and the, the scholarship behind it and so forth, they're compatible but not necessarily uh, essential. Um, but what better place to be? You have to be someplace. So you should be someplace with good mentorship and lots of uh, the, the school. It's better than just just a teacher at, at a school. You get the opportunity to work with other people. And something that um, I'll ask you if you've had these, these experiences, but something that we did not in our own schooling, but something we do as a group is we reached out for for professional help. If we were going to do something that included a, a sketch, we'd bring in people from the theater department. We had a great opportunity. We were out in Banff, Alberta, when they had a really hot program out there, and we could we could bring in conductors and dance people and choreographers and so forth to work with us, and they could help us um, really think about the other aspects of of performance. But the best part is. The opportunities that are seldom taken, but the opportunities to call in uh, really wonderful performers that are not, in our case, for example, tuba. You don't necessarily look for tuba players. You look for singers and violinists and uh, pianists that each instrument has its own abilities and difficulties. And it's always nice for a wind player to, to, to try to get the kind of... Uh, connected and even even playing of a of a, a keyboard instrument for example mm -hmm. we always have breaks or things that don't sound one note to the next there's some reason it's not exactly the same and then you start to emulate or to copy uh singers are are absolutely the best uh, because it's totally variable and a really fine singer with that variability and accuracy uh, copying that. And I think that's what, what a music school can offer that's that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, speaking about like being inspired by different artists, like I'm sure a lot of people wonder like what what kind of sounds are going through your head when you're, I mean, because I, I listen to Thomas Hampson a lot, <laughs> especially I, I did some, um, I played some Mahler lead a couple years ago on a recital and I just came across his recordings and his voice is just, I mean, I feel like it's sort of, we can easily imitate it on our instrument because it's a similar tessitura, but I mean, what, what kind of sounds are you hearing in your head when you think about, you know, ideal sound? Well, for me, the, the vocalese is the, is kind of the key. Um, I had a, uh, a brilliant brother-in-law that was steeped in literature, opera, uh, song, and uh, introduced me to the Diedrich Fischer Disco recordings very early on. And the clarity and somehow the familiarity, it, it, it's a beautiful voice, but somehow it still reaches you. Very often a voice seems like it's out there and it's, it's not personal. Somehow it was a very personal, but just 
beautiful ex execution. It just uh, just created a, a wonderful opportunity. And then I was really uh, uh, very lucky to meet really fine musicians early on. I started studying with Arnold Jacobs when I was in high school. Very, very fortunate. I, I don't think it would have been the same without that experience. And my own family had uh, generations of musicians and we had a, uh, one of my uncles was a singer and he was uh, one of these tenors, the heartthrob of the community. He could sing all the folk songs, but also the classical repertoire. And my father was a trombonist. So I wanted to be like my dad, basically. That's the only reason, uh, uh, the only reason I really uh, uh, played is I got to, to play with my dad. He would, he liked to practice every night. He was a music teacher, but he'd practice every night trauma. And I'd just play along. So, you know, how lucky is that to have that kind of upbringing? Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I think it's sort of what I can surmise from what you just said was just the, all those musicians had such a personal impact on you. And it's not like, I mean, I'm sure that you can list like so and so, all these famous musicians that you really like their sound, but I mean, talking about how, you know, these, these really amazing musicians have this ability to sort of reach out into the audience and say something or do something or make a sound that really makes you pay attention to them almost immediately. I think that's like what we all strive for as artists. I think very often people, uh, they, they see the execution. They're not necessarily aware of the time and effort it takes to look like you're playing effortlessly. Yeah. It's, uh, and, and any help you can get and any encouragement. Um, Jared, you're really good at, at uh, technical things. Are we getting some questions here we should be answering before we introduce yeah, I mean, amazing we, guest? We can ask. I mean, if anybody has any questions in the, in the comments, um, for Chuck, probably not for me, but mostly for Chuck, <laughs> uh, I guess we could, uh, we could answer those. So I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. So if any, okay. if any questions come up. Nice. Um, but I guess, I mean, one question that I, I'm sort of thinking about for you is that, I mean, after how many, after so many years in the Canadian brass, can you just like a couple of your top experiences? I mean, we've been talking a little bit lately about um, some of your experiences with the Wagner CD in, in Germany and, and all those. And I mean, just for the people who are listening, like what, are, what are some of the top things that just come to mind? Well, Chris Coletti played with us for, for many years. He's a, a valued friend and colleague. He'd stay in every day and say, this is the best day of my life. So it's always kind of looking forward. I, uh, I'm reticent to look back and say, okay, the Carnegie Hall experience was great. Or going to China in 1977, the international map were the first Westerners uh, to perform in China after the smashing of the Gang of Four. It was an amazing time politically. Uh, to be standing on uh, July 1st in Canada, of course, is Canada Day. And uh, they always have a big uh, production up on the hill. And uh, a standout memory is 200,000 people standing in front of you because you have the, uh, the parliament right behind you that build this great big stage. So there's 200,000 people and the American embassy is right at the end of that. So when you're speaking, your voice comes back to you and the mic comes back bouncing off the American embassy. And I remember standing there and in front of me was Prime Minister Trudeau, the elder at that time, and his finance minister and the soon to be the John Turner was right there, Jean Chrétien, these are people that became prime ministers. They're all in the front row. I could, I could have reached out and, and shaken their hand. They're that close. And I'm speaking French. My knees were Fortunately, the pants were wide enough. You didn't see my knee shaking, speaking French in front of the... Oh, man. So that was a big experience. So needless to say, that, that memory would never fail. And uh, a, a really wonderful moment was playing the Bateau Mouche in Paris in, uh, very early on, 1972. We, uh, we were invited to be... They have a, music, a cruise where there's somebody telling you what all the buildings are, and then they took one cruise in the late afternoon called the musical cruise and we performed and talked to the audience and did our thing as the boat toured the center aisle in Paris and uh, that was really an amazing experience and, and uh, the first day we walked on the boat unbeknownst to us we walked on and there were 
our friends from Hamilton had come to surprise us. And you know who they are, right, Jared? The of course Bacons. they do. Where did, where did you meet them? In Miami. They are the Canadian Brass's biggest fans. I mean, next to me, of course. But um, yeah, that, that, I mean, those just sound like amazing experiences. Um, one question that we've gotten just now is that, uh, you know, this person is acknowledging that you've played a lot of different horns. And I knew, of course, that hardware would come up in a tuba talk. Um, but what are your favorite instruments that you own and why? Um, and do you have any guidance about choosing a different horn? Um, yeah, play something that you enjoy playing. There's, there's, there's an F, E flat, C, and B flat. Those are your choices for instruments. And people wonder, why do you play this or why do you play that? And um, for me, I played a C instrument because uh, in my era, everybody thought you had to have a basic C instrument in, in North America and then smaller instruments later. And uh, meanwhile, the F has become really important. Jared, I know you play an F as well. Um, for the clarity and the upper voice, it's very beautiful. And they finally figured out the low range on F2, so it's an all around instrument. It wasn't when I was playing. So I memorized some things in C and I'm kind of stuck. I'd love to change horns, but that's another issue. As far as the instruments I play, um, I started way back when, one of the finest horns I played was when I was starting out, I was in high school. And I had a King sousaphone. And the King sousaphone had, the bell comes off and that bell was a one piece bell. It was really a beautiful instrument. But it's not, uh, I think sousaphones now, if they've come back on the Tonight Show band, you'll see the sousaphones and uh, in the La Banda movement, it's become a big deal. But sousaphone just basically disappeared after high school, got rid of that. And then I had a con, uh, B flat tuba that I grew up on, and that was, uh, it was, it was called a Pan American, which was actually a student horn. It was a wonderful instrument. And then I got into the German horns, played mirror phone for many years, took it to the walls. I think I told you, Jared, and I'll tell the audience, I had this great picture. In fact, you might see it on the website. We're walking down the wall in five, five abreast, and I'm playing that mirror phone. It's a tall bell. And I said to mirror phone at the time, you should use this for your advertising and say, mirror phone goes to the wall. <laughs> Somehow they didn't quite like the, never quite resonated with them. Okay, I think that's a, we have that's an a, exciting. That's, that's a missed opportunity, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, they Big can time. Still the, wall. the picture's still there. Yeah. Okay, Jared, why don't you introduce our guest? This is someone very dear to my heart, and it turned out that uh, you as well. And here we are again from my vantage point of playing 50 years, and your vantage point of just getting started. And here we are talking about the same amazing talent. Yeah, you know, you talk about sounds in your head. And this guy, I mean, think, comes pretty close. I mean, next to you, of course, Chuck. <laughs> but when you, uh, when you talk about sounds in your head, I, mean, I think this guy comes pretty close for a lot of people. Storied career, started at University of Michigan, played uh, in the Houston Symphony for many years, and then also the New York Philharmonic for several years, now lives in Denver. And uh, I've studied with him both at New World Symphony and at Aspen, and I think it's, it's just so cool that he's willing to spend a little bit of time with us today. Warren, welcome. Hi there, how's everybody? Better now to see you in person. Great to see you, Warren. <laughs> there he the is. World, the world we live in. <laughs> it looks like you have a little more sun than the, the, the two of us. Well, it's snowing. We got oh. about four inches of snow and we're supposed to get you know, maybe two more today. So, and it's April 16th, so. Warren, you've had an amazing career. We first met, uh, I think it was 1983. You may recall two. this. 82? My recollection is two. <laughs> in Ottawa. <laughs> yeah. And we played the double brass and it was before, it was even pre, pre Alessi. That's how long ago it was. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, who played trombone with us? Do you remember? Uh, uh, yes, I do. Uh, I, I don't remember his name, but it was a friend of uh, Phil Smith's and he was uh, in the uh, Salvation Movement. He'd been an Eastman graduate. Charlie and, uh, um, Vernon or Charlie Baker? That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you, your memory's perfect. 
This is great. <laughs> uh oh, that's also so, dangerous. <laughs> I, I I needed prompting. You you notice that so so. <clears throat> so Warren, after, after the, uh, I think you were the, one of the first tubas to come out so brilliantly from the uh, Michigan, uh, Ann Arbor. You know, um, I grew up in Ann Arbor. You know, from from like junior high on. So uh, I was I was well aware of you know the university, but they never had a tuba teacher. So um, by the time I was a senior in high school. I didn't apply to Michigan. Um, I applied to Curtis because I wanted to study with Sorchinsky. Um, there wasn't an opening because at that time they had one opening every four years. Um, and it just, you know, I didn't, I didn't fit that cycle. I applied to Northwestern and I applied to Indiana, you know, with, with Jacobs and, and uh, Harvey Phillips. And uh, about January of that year, I heard that Michigan had hired Torchinsky away from the Philadelphia Orchestra. So I quickly got an application in, you know, in the nick of time, and uh, and ended up ended up going there. Um, and it's funny, I never played an audition because you know all of, all of the people who were uh, who would have been on the audition committee had heard me play solo and ensemble contests over the years, and they just said, you know, we know how you play, just you know, don't bother, just just send in a send in a uh, an application. So I did, and um, so Torchinsky and I started at Michigan the same fall. Um, so it, it, it was fantastic. Studying with wow. that guy was just, you know, he was like he was a second a, father to me and, and, and I already had a really great first father. So I won the father lottery. <laughs> nice. Was, uh, was Torchinsky, I, I kind of always thought of him as being in the Bell, I wouldn't say Absolutely. school, but era, the Bell. For sure. Yeah, he, I mean, he worshiped him and, and just, you know, thought he was really great. And uh, by his account, Bell treated him like a, like a, a kid of his own as well. Um, and, and he certainly did that with me. Well, for, uh, for watchers and listeners that are not as familiar with the tuba world as we might be, Bill Bell was the, uh, really the person that brought tuba to the, to the, um, I'd say the public view. He was, he was uh, in the New York Philharmonic, and at, at one point there's talk where the conductor puts the baton down and says, "Just to the York, she says, play that again." And made uh, Mr. Bell play a part on his own. He said, "That's true artistry." He really singled them out in the orchestra. Meanwhile, he he wasn't. He put a tuba on, and, and he wore a tuba. He was a very very big man, Bill Huge Bell. So he didn't play it and hold it in front of him. He wore it. And he'd play a suit <laughs> fold. It was up under his arm. And yeah. he'd, do, he'd do things like uh, um, uh, the, the strongest man in the band, the tuba player in the band. He'd do a, uh, uh, when you replace the rumba on the tuba. And he would do things that were fun and interesting as well as this great or orchestral ability. And he was a beautiful singer. He had this really rich baritone voice. You know, and, and it was just, it just came out of him so easily. Um, and the story you just told was actually, it was when he was in NBC and it was Toscanini. Mm. Um, and they were playing Einfaust Overture, the opening of Einfaust Overture. And, you know, my, my teacher, Torczynski, always would tell me that, that he would play that. And that slur, the octave slur from the upper B flat down to the low E flat, B flat, sorry. Um, he always described it as somebody pouring thick oil just down the, you know, it was, it was just really connected, you know? And, you know, I mean, he made me play that from, from freshman on. And I always felt completely inadequate about that. Um, and then I think I was a sophomore one time, we went down to Cincinnati for, they were having a, a regional tuba geek conference down there. And Sam Green, you know, another guy who studied with Bill Bell was down there. He taught at you know, Cincinnati and played in the orchestra all those years. And Torchinsky made me play that in front of everybody with him there. And I thought, no, don't do this. I can't, I, I can't, I can't play this lick <laughs> and sound like thick oil, you know? So I played it, you know, and it, you know, for me, it was, for me, it was a good, it was a good version for me, but I was still sitting there thinking, ah, this is terrible, you know? And I got a little validation because Sam came up and he says, good <laughs> yeah so um it was helpful and, and interesting thing was um 
I had heard about this for years and years and years. And one time we were on tour and we had played in Niagara, a, a summer tour. And the orchestra was doing right of spring. And so Don Harry was on that with us. And so he, he carted the, you know, he carted the whole brass section in bands over to his house in Buffalo, where I had Buffalo chicken wings for the first time. <laughs> and Don had all these fantastic recordings of all these old, you know, legendary people that, that I had heard about, but actually never heard. And Gordon Pulis was, was one of those, he was a trombone player and everybody talked about this guy's sound. And I thought, man, you know, I, I sure wish I was around to hear it. Well, Don had recordings of that guy and he put them on and, you know, just old, the fidelity of the recordings is not really that great, but still this guy had a beautiful sound. And he said, oh, by the way, he says, I have a recording of Mr. Bell playing Ein Faust Overture. And I said, I've got to hear this. And he played it. And I, you know, it, it actually confirmed to me that my version was wholly inadequate. It, it just was, you know, I've never, I've never heard anything like it. It was just really astonishing. Yeah. And, and, and Toscanini had him play it like three or four times. And finally Bell said, is there a problem? He says, no, it just sounds so good. I want to hear it again. You know? Yeah. So. Was it, was it a, was it a difficult or an easy step for you from college to, I think your first, your first job was a major one it was Houston, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, when I was in college, I played in the Grand Rapids Symphony for two years. And so I used to, you know, schlep two and a half hours over to Grand Rapids. And they had a they had an in-residence brass quintet uh, at the time. And and so I played in that brass quintet and and um, you know, and then then in the orchestra. So, you know, I had some experience playing in an orchestra. Um, and I'll never forget, here's another Torchinsky story. I, I could never say this to a student today, but, but living in Grand Rapids, they paid me enough where I could have lived just fine there. And when I was through with college, he told me, he says, if you stay there, I'll never speak to you again. He said, you get out of there. He says, go to New York, you know, because that's what he did, you know? So he says, you go to New York, you go do your thing. So you know, I picked up everything and I moved to New York with very little money in my pocket. Um, you know, really no place to live, no job. I, you know, I just, I moved to New York for, for a year and I found a job repairing brass instruments at um, Giardinelli, um, which was, you know, a, a big, you know, it was right in Midtown and, <clears throat> excuse me, they, they had a brass repair shop where, where uh, you know, if somebody if somebody's finger hook fell off of a trumpet or something, you know, they, they could run in there and get it soldered up real quick and, you know, and be out in time for their next session. Um, you know, so it was that kind of shop and he had a lot of, a lot of products. So people were always coming in playing, playing instruments. I, I remember when I worked there, um, I was back hammer and dance and, um, you know, Bob Giardinelli comes back and he says, Arnold Jacobs is up there. Why don't you go up, you know, hang out with him and you know show them these tubas so i did and, and i had known him because i had had a couple of lessons so you know i i walk up there and and he's you know he said well, I, you know there are probably like 15 horns in the room of, of all different brands and you know use new you know all kinds of all kinds of stuff and he's sitting there playing and I'm, and I'm just saying man this is great i'm getting paid to listen to this guy play right now so um and then then after a while you know he finally said okay let me hear you play them and, you know, so I sit there and, you know, flip, 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 you know, and, and, and he says, yeah, that's great. And, you know, and, and at the end of the day, you know, he says, I'll take that one, that one, that one, that one. He says, pack them up and send them to my studio. And I thought, man, you know, here I am making a dollar 98, you know, uh, at, at Giardinelli and this guy can go and buy, you know, four tubas and, and, and think nothing of it. Um, well, you pursued that. It's interesting. Giardinelli was kind of a, you lived in that era. We're, we're kind of the last uh, guys to be able to talk about, particularly in New York, when the jingle industry, you had, you had... Right, right. The number one job was playing those jingles. The next would be Broadway, and then it would be traveling shows. And, and there were some Giardinelli, movies at the time, too. Sorry? There were some movies being done there at the time. Okay. A few, a few not like L.A., but, but still a few being done. You would have probably met just about everybody that was performing at that time. That was a real draw. And it, these are things that we can talk about and they're just images now to, to younger players like Jarrett because um, 
it's all gone. The, uh, the fact that you could go to uh, Pedelson's and find any music you wanted, and you right. could go to Giardinelli and look at any instrument you wanted, and you right. had really exotic instruments hanging on the wall. You could get fantastic things there. And the, and the prices were great. Yep. And uh, the tuba players you'd meet in New York, they probably had a little black book with all the gigs. They had to go hour by hour. And this, this, is, this, is a, a, this is a bygone era. It really is. It really is. Yeah. Do I sound old now? <laughs> it's okay. I'm always the oldest person in the room. We're fine. <laughs> You're just a kid, Warren. You were a kid when I met you. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> but we always had the impression, and I, I'm curious from your side how you maybe viewed us or viewed your own relationship with the group, but it was very unusual. The New York Brass Quintet that uh, we invited to Ottawa was the first experience and CBC we had a, a huge show which was wonderful and then from that experience we continued uh, inviting you everything we could think of and we made I think you're on at least four really amazing albums uh, which we can draw people's attention to later we can send a message out but the, uh, the, the playing the, the Monteverdi the big vespers yeah. with you I'll never yeah. forget it and um, when we met you guys, I remember the first thing that happened, I think we uh, we went to the stage door at Lincoln Center, thinking, okay, we're coming in just then. Uh, you and uh, and Phil Smith were rushing out the door. And we, said, we said, oh, uh, hi, we met really quick. And he said, well, we're just going over to get, can we bring you some coffees? We thought, wow, this is an auspicious way to start. You guys offering us coffees? <laughs> We, were quite we thought you were a big deal. We, we, you know, we thought we hit pay dirt getting to play with you guys. Are you <laughs> kidding? <laughs> and, and we're coming in there meekly, like trying to hide out. No, it was really great. It was a great experience. <clears throat> and from our, from my point of view, you were always the, you were the person that could keep everything on an even keel. I don't think we ever had an angry word amongst us or a, a, a true argument. That's and true. You were always the guy that that had a new joke and something new to talk about and some serious advice to share. And it was uh, without getting into personalities, you had a pretty wide range of personality. And I felt that you kept that, that uh, even keel in the group. Well, that's really kind of you to say. That's a <laughs> very kind thing. I mean, all I can say is thanks. That's Another nice. thing I remember, and this is also a bygone era, was you and Phil Myers coming into rehearsal. We're all there and you're coming in. And I think it was parking a car was taking too long. And you both had your car radios under your arm. That was the era when people like to steal car I radios. never had a car radio. I mean, okay, so that was just Phil. Yeah, he came yeah. out with a car radio under his arm <laughs> so it wouldn't get stolen. <laughs> Yeah, we so finally got we finally got to the point where you know we, we started paying to park downstairs below Lincoln Center because it, you know it was it was so worth it to know that you you were gonna not be late by by looking for a parking place you know. So Warren, where did you uh, first meet Jarrett? Um, I've invited Jarrett to be my co-host on these because of the fact that a he's a wonderful tuba player, b he's Canadian, c uh, he's a nice guy. Uh, you may disagree. I don't know when you. Oh, I, I come. I how you first met him, but, more. <laughs> and he can't play. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's all true. You know, I I met him first. Um, the New World Symphony would have me down from time to time. You know, to coach folks down there, and I met him the first time there. Um, and you know, I I don't know how the I you know, I've come to learn that I think, you know, the pe the fellows in the orchestra, you know, say, you know, let's bring so-and-so in. And um, I don't know whether Jared requested me. There was a trombone player I'd worked with Aspen at Aspen. I think Nick, Nick uh, Platoff, who's now in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'd worked with him in Aspen. So, you know, he was, he was the guy I knew when I went down there at that time and, and Jared was there. And I said, you know, oh, this this guy's fun. This is, you know, so I just I had a I had a ball, and I don't know. You're usually there three four days, and you know, and you get more than one lesson. I mean, you know, you get to hang out and interact, and and I thought, man, this was this was really a this was really a fun thing. I, you know, I had a good time, and then I would always encourage him to send me a good tape for Aspen because you know, 
I listen to the Aspen Tape blind and, and, you know, I, I just want to, I just want everybody to have a chance. You just have to send something good. Um, so I, I was always after him. All right, send me a good tape, send me a good tape. And he did, you know? So, so we had, we had a summer, one summer, we had two. And one then, summer. One, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, had yeah. one summer at Aspen together. So. Yeah. Well, first of all, Warren, I definitely did not request you. So it must have been someone else. <laughs> well, yeah. well, then, then you are the smart one. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean that, that you're you're talking about those those periods of three or four days where you were down in Miami and just that access to to the teachers we had down there, particularly you. I mean, especially with with tuba players. Whenever a tuba player came down, like I would sort of just block off those days in my schedule and not plan anything because I knew that you know any extra time that I could get with you or any of the other coaches was just I mean, it was awesome. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was like, I mean, so I'm a yoga teacher. I teach yoga right. in, my, in my spare time, but you were one of the first people who sort of illuminated me uh, to the power of meditation. And meditation was a, was a big part of um, uh, my, you know, yoga teacher training and stuff like that. But I remember us having dinner one night and you talking to me about your process of how you sort of center and how you meditate and how you view um sort of like your active role in meditation I, I don't know if you remember exactly what you said to me but I still remember exactly what you said to me you know um I never like properly meditated you know I I didn't I didn't have uh a set process that looked all the same I suppose but 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 I did I did learn you know, I, I practiced something that I, that I called j just sitting, and and it was it was the practice of observing yourself think. You know, so I mean, you know, for sure, you know, in yoga classes, both before when you when you you know sit you know do an opening meditation in yoga class, and when you do shavasana at the end of it of yoga, class, you know, I mean, you know, this 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 sort of thing comes in and I've, I've heard it described different ways as, you know, people, people saying, you know, that thoughts are just clouds and you just, you just watch them float by. Uh, I've heard it described that way. The, the way, the way it was taught to me was um, that you are, you are an observer sitting on the bank of a river and the river are your thoughts. And you, you just sit there and watch them, watch, watch them flow by and you observe them. You, you notice that they're there, but you don't engage them. Um, and you know, I, I, I know myself and I will tell everybody when I, when I work with people this way, that sooner or later, there's going to be a thought that's so intriguing. It will hook you. It, you know, it will just grab you and it'll, it'll pull you in the water and, and you'll entertain it for a while. You'll have an internal dialogue with that thought and, you know, and run around, you know, and then, and then you will realize at some point, oh, this, I'm supposed to be observing this, not interacting with it. And so the trick is unhook yourself, get back on the bank of the river and get back to an observer standpoint. And what may happen in that moment is you judge yourself and say, oh, that was terrible. I, you know, I, I, I made a mistake, you know, and you'll get engaged in that thought and find yourself in the river yet again. So, you know, you have to realize that the thought that I just made a mistake is just a thought as well. And you can choose to engage it or you can choose to let it pass. Um, and, and, and the practice of this is, is if you can let all thoughts pass, no matter what thought comes in front of you, if you can let them all pass, you can then choose what to engage in any moment and what not to. Um, so it, it leaves you, I think, in a better mental place to, to manage the myriad of, of, you know, of thoughts that your mind throws at you. And, and the, when you get to that observer point, where you where you truly are saying wow look at all those thoughts go by and and you know you're not engaged in anyone the question then becomes okay who's who is who is watching those thoughts who is that you know um and you know and what about that and is that a thought you know and it goes on and on and on it's you know it's it's, it's like those images where they're a bunch of mirror you know you're between two mirrors and you know and, and, and it goes on and on it you know it ends up being like that but but at some point you I would find that it would be quiet you know the, the space between the thoughts would get greater and greater and you would find 
just real quiet for a while. Um, and it begins a place where you can mentally uh, remember. And it becomes to be a, a place mentally you can go to, you know, at the drop of a hat, you know, really, really quickly um, and, and find that place. Um, and it's, I would start off with like five minutes at a time. I just set a timer for five minutes. It's astonishing how, how quiet things can get and, and how many thoughts your mind can spit out. It's just a thought machine. You realize that your mind is a thought machine. It's its job, you know, so you, you're just gonna let it do its job and, and you're gonna sit there and observe it. And like I said, if you can get to, the, get to the place where you can pick and choose what to engage and what not to engage and not plug into a thought because it's intriguing, you have the mental discipline to stay out of thoughts that are intriguing. Uh, it puts you, it puts you in, a, in, a, in a place of calm uh, when it could be in the middle of chaos. This um, is very, very familiar territory. You, you know that the, the brass have a long history of the transcendental meditation and the idea of thoughts developing. And then there's that moment that you're talking about when you can choose to now go back. And that's, that's the beautiful moment when you realize. And the fact that you can call that up on a moment's notice, this is very, very desirable. This is why people meditate if you can be working in that in that state it changes your whole outlook to the, the process and the project what something you might be doing and it, it allows you to concentrate on what really matters and not lose focus of that um, and not be distracted by other things well you're way ahead of this this is there's a lot of chatter now about this because everybody is uh, sequestered either alone or with somebody that they live with and it's it's giving a lot of time now to be with yourself and to think things through and to really look at what is important what are these things that are seem to be so constantly urgent and now you say well it's not that urgent because I could do this this week or next week maybe if we're going to be here in June you know it, it takes that pressure off and now we're starting to really um, deal with this fact. This is something that should have been a companion all along. This idea that you can go into a state of repose and get away. And music is perfect for this, uh, particularly instrumentalists. We don't have words. We're not being told what to think. Right. When to think it. We're playing music, and it takes you away from all this. Uh, uh, well, you must think this about this issue, or, or you're crazy. But if you're thinking this, or that, and this is what what. Uh, particularly young, uh, young kids dealing with music that won't necessarily be professional, but it's an opportunity to get away from that. Here's what you need to know about this subject. Here's what you have to do. This is how you have to send back this information. Suddenly you're in this other frame of, of music away from those thoughts. You know, I've always looked at it as um, temporal mastery um, because, you know, what, what we do is temporal. Um, it, it happens in a moment and you know the to get what you want to happen in, in just the moment that you want to have it happen in is you know a certain level of of focus and i mean i can think of you know athletics i can think of you know that being paramount in in, in an endeavor like that and those folks learn to do that you know the successful ones um musicians um you know, certainly like ballet, acting, you know, any kind, any kind of thing where you need to have a certain moment happen in a, you know, just, just a certain way in a given moment. I, you know, I think is, I think is uh, not such a common skill. Um, what I think it's done for me is it's, it's altered my sense of time um, because uh, just, just a simple, just a simple stoplight changing from red to green or from green to yellow or, or something like that, that, that to me seems like a, a, a much uh, longer, longer moment of time because, you know, as musicians, you sit there and say, okay, this, but I, that's not together, you know, and most people think, well, that's, you know, that's together, but musicians don't think of it that way. So we have, we have an altered sense of time. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 the mastery of that time, 
I think has ramifications for probably a lot of stuff that you can do. Yeah, yeah, you got leeway in, in many things. Um, you know, whether I write a paper tonight or tomorrow morning when it's due next Friday, you know, is is not not so material. But but in in terms of in terms of seeing a whole bunch of things come together and happen at one time, even from a managerial standpoint, if you're managing people, and 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 you want you want to have this moment happen, you know, right here and right now, um, you sort of have to create that in your mind, you know, you, even though you're dealing with other people, you have to you have to imagine them and and then and then you know support them in getting that done. And so, you know, I, I think temporal mastery can can find its find its uses in, in many, many walks of life. Where this seems really prevalent is in the uh, any field of sports where you have competition and the need to win and you do everything you can possibly do to make that win a possibility. And one of them is uh, uh, the whole idea of structuring, structuring thinking differently. Um, anytime. Uh, our famous hockey personality here, uh, uh, Gretzky, was questioned, and he'd say he'd see a, a play develop way before anybody else would even consider it a play yet, and he'd see it develop and how to take it to its logical conclusion. Uh, in baseball, I've read something. I, I have no way to, to prove this, and I'm really curious myself about this. I want to find more about this. But in testing the reaction of a batter, the batter actually has to make a decision to swing at a ball before it leaves the pitcher's hand. It doesn't make sense, but what is that that's happening? And these are the things that uh, a teacher like you, I'm sure, deals with constantly, which is you have students in front of you that want to know technically, how do I do this and how do I do that? And you're basically telling them, a lot of these things fall in place if you just do your homework and listen to the song and play the music. You know, I think that's true. And I think you know, the other thing that I think is, is that without the technical facility at hand, it might not happen. Even if you see it, even if you visualize it, even if you're Wayne Gretzky and you see it happening, if you don't have the basic skating skills and the basic puck handling skills that that guy had, I, you know, I don't think that he would have been in a place to make the plays that he did. So, you know, in, in, in addition to that vision, in addition to, to knowing that, that, that thinking well can, can have a huge impact on what you're doing, if you lack the basic skills, um, you know, it, it's, it's like, it's, it's a bit of a speech impediment, basically. Um, well, I think there's the idea that you have to be really, really well prepared to take yeah. advantage of luck. You no, know, uh, an audition is often a lottery. You'll have uh, maybe a hundred people show up for an audition for, could be a place on Broadway or a place in a symphony orchestra. And you're gonna have, let's say you're gonna have at least a half a dozen people that would be amazing for that engagement. Well, right. how do you make that, how do you make that decision? Right. And yep. where's your, does your karma lead you to, lead you to this result? Yep. Yeah, you know, I heard I heard an interesting analogy once. I mean, I was I think I was watching a football game, and some wide receiver just made an amazing grab. I mean, you know, his body twisted in a pretzel, and you know, he's out there, and and he, and he grabbed this he grabbed this ball out of out of nowhere. And I remember the announcer saying, "Who who was who was an athlete themselves? Who who had been through some of this?" He said, you know, it's one thing to train so that it becomes a possibility for you to do that. It's another thing to train so that it's an impossibility for anything other than that to happen. You know, and that's just, that's a whole nother level of, of training. And you're going to run into folks out there who train that way. And when you do, they're going to be monsters. <laughs> just right. gonna, you're going to think, wow, this is really something. You know, and and the 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 physical mastery of, of, of the behaviors and the techniques and stuff like it, it, it is such that they don't ever think about that. Um, they they just they just see art and 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 the mechanics and, and the apparatus just allow it. 
I'm wondering if you remember a great moment. Uh, well, a great moment for me, and I'm wondering if you remember. We were doing a Gabrielli work with uh, Canadian Brass in, in New York, and it was set up a little differently. It wasn't the usual uh, trumpet in each choir. Our choir was you, Phil Myers, and myself. Just the three of us were the choir. And the way we set up was you were on my right, Phil was on my left, meaning both of your bells aimed at me. I was in the middle and we started recording and we started playing and I honestly couldn't hear myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we could hear you, Chuck. Because I, mean, listen, I, I listen to those CDs from time to time and I, I got to say, your sound is always present. Your sound just has an amazing presence. It always has, always, always will. And 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 you may have felt like in the middle of that you couldn't hear, but I but I'll bet you hundred bucks you go and listen to that spot on the recording and you're there. Well, it was an amazing moment. <clears throat> I learned a lot sitting between you guys. Well, well likewise, yeah. you know, it was I, for us. It was such. I don't know. I. I'm speaking for myself, but but I can kind of speak for my colleagues in New York too, because you know we, we talked about this, and 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 we always talked about how much fun those get-togethers with you guys were. I mean, we always always looked forward to them, because it was just such a fun time. Mm -hmm. We were going to play fun music. We were going to be challenging music. Um, you know, there was going to be camaraderie. There was going to be uh, people who were really great at getting along. People that are that are, that are really fine ensemble players who are who are really good at, at, at finding you know the group mind of, of what an ensemble is going to sound like and you know I, I was thinking about that this morning you know when when before we came on and you know just just the stuff that when you and I sat together and and we decided what we were going to do you know who who was you know you know, how are we going to do this? You taking this down an octave? What, you know, are we going to play this unison? You know, or is somebody going to go up? You know, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to balance this? Well, you know, that, that kind of stuff. It was always so easy to do that with you. And, you know, and I, I think most of the time we thought very much alike, you know, but it, it was, it was usually like two questions that, and we had it and, and, you know, we're off to the races and, you know, getting to work with people, and have it be that easy and that much fun and that quick is not a common thing. And, and so I, I think we all experienced that. And, and we, I, I'm telling you, there were, there were five people that always looked forward to our get together. It, you know, it was just, you know, I think I told you last time I saw you, you know, I, I was talking to Ronnie Rom about two summers ago and, you know, we just ran into each other. And I told him, I said, you know, these, these are the recordings with you guys and the stuff we did together are some of my favorite musical memories, you know, uh, in my life, because I just had a great time. And, and, and he said that they were for him too. And I was so gratified to hear that at least it was a two-way street with one of you, because I, I can tell you that five of us felt that way. That's amazing. And, and what we always uh, really welcomed was your guy's willingness to go to the absolute end to make sure it was perfect before we took it out on stage. That uh, need to be as good as you possibly could be was really encouraging for us. Uh, I have another nice memory like that, which was we were recording in uh, Philadelphia. It was another big uh, recording where we had the Philadelphia Orchestra guys right. and New York. So my recollection was you guys had to get on a train to get to Philadelphia for the recording. And I think we had a pretty early start, like nine o'clock. So you must have been up very early. We recorded nonstop. I think if we took 20 minutes out for lunch, that would be about the max. So we played right into the last second so you could catch a train back in time to go back to the orchestra hall and play Mahler, I believe. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was just that was just the life, you know, because it was just it was just go, 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 go. And, um, you know, it always astonished me, you know, that, okay, tuba players can play forever. You know, I mean, <laughs> we, it was like 10 hours. Okay, fine. But, you know, the trumpets and the horns, that's another ball game. And, man, I'm telling you, you know, Smith and, and Myers, those guys could sit there and just crank this stuff out all day. Yeah, you want another thing? Okay, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Um, it was really... 
it set a standard. Now all these young kids, you probably see this, Warren, with your, your teaching and your exposure to all these, these young kids, they think this is normal now. Like Jared, I mean, he's nonstop. This guy is amazing. We met Jared, first met Jared. It was a competition going on here in Canada. And uh, Eugene Watts and I were judges and it was all brass. So anybody could have won. It could have been a trumpet or, right. you know, the normal, a French horn or a trumpet is what you expect. And uh, that's where we first heard Jarrett. He came in and played a solo. And first of all, he looked totally relaxed, which upset me. And uh, he just played great. And there was no question. He just, uh, there was there was not really a, a reasonable second. I mean, Jarrett was just way out ahead of the pack. And that was well, long Jarrett. enough ago. I bet he plays even better. I don't know. Is that possible? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know about that. I think I was better back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Warren, um, this is... This has been fantastic uh, uh, to have you on the, uh, oh, by the way, it's a, we are the North, you know, we won a championship uh, this past spring. Yeah. At any rate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple questions from some people if you, if you want to take a few questions, Warren, before sure, you have to sure. skedaddle. Um, first question is, uh, playing in a section, how do you judge the balance of the trombones? You know, I think, well, the first first thing I would say is is get used to the acoustic space that you find yourself in most of the time. Um, then then beyond that, I think it's just playing together a lot, and you get you get used to a sound. And also, if you can find somebody who uh, whose ears you trust, who can go you know far away and listen to you. Um, and, and see how you sound far away and give you feedback. You know, I, I, I think you can eventually learn from that. I, I suppose what I'm saying is it's, it's, it's not an easy question to answer and it's not an easy thing to figure out on day one. I think, I think it requires a lot of, a lot of uh, time and experience doing it. And I think it requires a lot of feedback from, from folks that you trust so that you over time get a sense of, okay, this is not, this is too much. This is not enough. And, and, you know, and then, and then know full well that if you ask a hundred people about that balance level, you're probably going to get mm, at least 80 different answers about what's appropriate or not. Um, so I, I think one of the things I look for is that one, I can find my sound in theirs and two, they can find their sound in mine. So that so that when when those when those two elements happen, uh, then 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 there's a sound that those only those four or five you know whatever you're talking about people can create because you know every every sound is unique. Um, but in order to do that, things have to be in tune and they have to be in balance. And so when you find that when you find that thing where there there's there's like a if you have four players there. And they're in tune, and it almost sounds like there's a fifth or a sixth player involved. When you when you hear that come back from the room, I think you're there. I mean, so that that's what I that's what I look for. You know, I for years and years I've I've always tried to hear the room. You know, hear 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 the totality of the space, whether it's a small space or a big space, um, and and use that room, use whatever feedback that comes to give you information and that feedback may only be a nanosecond but but you you know you learn to you learn to hear it. we talked earlier about musicians having having a different sense of time you know a nanosecond becomes a, a, lo a long enough moment where you can where you can judge uh what's coming back so i you know i would use the room and the feedback and it, you know and if and if, if if the chord's out of balance when the room feeds it back well then i have some information that's great yeah and then just just one more question about sort of the, the time that we're in and I, i'm curious about this as well what are you telling your students to work on in this sort of like subsidized time that we now have like all this extra time during the, the quarantine where you know you could get a lot of work done on your instrument in the months that we have extra so so what are you telling your students right now to work on basically i think it's a great time for folks to um sweat the details. Um, I, I, I was saying, you know, people who've been around me have heard me say this, you know, a, a lot, but I always think the difference between a great player and a good player 
isn't one or two major big, big things. It's more like a hundred details. So, um, you know, th the great players have figured out 100 little small details and everything is in place. And there's no, there's no kind of schmutz or crust or anything. It's just, it's just music and sound. You know, it's timbre of their instrument and, and musical thought behind it. Um, and in order to do that, you have to be adept at scrubbing out you know, artifacts, I, you know, I, I call them artifacts and every instrument, every instrument has like an artifact sound. You know, if, if you go to piano, you know, and, and play some notes, you know, the artifact sound is, is the hammer hitting the string that, you know, there, there's a percussive sound to that. And, you know, to me, that's like extra musical. That's not, that's not really, that's not really part of the music. And then every once in a while, I'll hear a pianist play and I don't know, there's something about their touch that when they run through a run, I, I never hear the funk, you know, at the beginning of the, of, of the note. It's just, it's just like tone, you know? And, and so, you know, that pianist has scrubbed out the artifacts of what's inherent in their instrument that they produce. You know, a cello player, you know, you, you'll, you'll hear the bow hit the string, you know, and there, there, there's a grunch. And then every once in a while you hear a cello player where that's not the case. Um, and, you know, speaking as a tuba player, you know, I can hear a lot of folks go, bruh, 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 you know, where, where the articulations are not, they're not pristine. Um, and uh, it, it's a great time to scrub that kind of garbage out of your playing so that, so that what somebody hears is pitch and tone. And when all they hear is pitch and tone for extended periods of time, the only thing they can hear from then on is the musical thought that's behind that or the lack thereof. Um, so, so understand for me that, that, that the musical thought is allowed to come through only when there's no schmutz. Otherwise there's a distraction off of, off of the musical thought. So since we don't have to go and play concert, it seems to me it's a great time to learn to slur without garbage in between two notes, learn to articulate in a pristine way, learn to learn to shape notes in a way that you want them and how they're going to fit into an overall phrase. Um, learn to learn to release notes in a way that there's going to be a ring off into the room. Um, you know, and all those, all those kinds of finesse details, uh, you know, to make you a, a, a more, you know, pristine, beautiful players so that people can just, you know, I, Vince Panzarella described it once, you know, he, he, he described hearing a, 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 a recording of Simone Mantia, you know, and he said, it's just like hearing that guy, it's just like somebody going and opening up their head and looking into their musical mind because there's no, there's nothing in between your ear and that musical mind. It's yeah. Just, it comes through that clean. And my way of describing it is, um, is a window. And then your, the scene on the other side of the window is your art. And the window is your craft. Um, so, you know, you can, you can paint the most beautiful scene beyond that window, but if that window has got a lot of dirt on it, the person perceiving that is gonna have to try and make it out through all the dirt that's on that window. So, so, you know, to me, the time now would be to take your squeegee and scrub that window so that there's nothing in the way of seeing that beautiful picture that you have perhaps created on the other side of that window. Now, you can, you can think you're creating a, a picture on the other side of the window, but it actually is the city dump. So, you know, so you need to work on your art as well. So, you know, I, I, just, I just see it as, as you know, the window allows you to see through. I mean, you can have you can have perfect production and there's no flaws in your playing, but if there's a garbage musical idea on the other side of it, eh, you know, it's still not it's still not you know amazing. So we need we need both elements. And um, so I would I would say during the time, listen a lot, listen to the very best musical ideas that are out there, so that you can so that you have a good idea of what nice art is. And then the second thing, while you're sequestered, sit there and, and scrub your window. You know, if, if, you, if you've got a bugaboo note that you can't articulate well, 
figure it out. Warren, we got a, a message here that sums up, I think, all of our feelings. What wise words from Warren. Thank you so much for being our guest on our oh, first. Thanks for having me, guys. Oh, this has been great. Great really, to see really you both. Great. Likewise. Jared, Jared and I will be back uh, next week uh, talking some more tuba. And Warren, I hope we can have you uh, come back frequently. It's Anytime. I'm, I'm you know, happy to spend time with you guys. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, so thank Warren. You. Stay safe and healthy, everybody. Cheers. So bye from us. <laughs>